Good morning. And welcome to all of you, near and far. I'm almost losing the people among the quilts this morning. So much abundance. It's fabulous to have you all with us this morning. Today we are starting a new worship series and a chance for us to examine our lives in relationship to money. But I'll, before I go too much further, do take a look at uh, the announcements in the back of your bulletin. Uh, and are there any prayer requests this morning? Tina would like to share. Yes, so much bounty on that day, and so many thanks as it's helping navigate traffic that was all the way down to Memorial Field and beyond. Uh, my neighbor, when I got home, said, what was going on at your church today? Was there a memorial? And I'm like, no, second harvest food truck. And he's like, wow, good job. And so, yeah, he's like, did you know how far back? He couldn't even describe how far back the cars were. Oh, and we met that need, so thank you to all of you. Also, I'm, I'm realizing as I'm looking out and seeing Trish, um, knowing that uh, Bob is out in the field hunting, and I'm sure that we have others in our congregation that have begun the hunting season, so please, we hold them in prayers as they... Uh, both get renewal, because I know a lot of that is about being out in co creation and that their harvest may be uh, good and will help feed their families uh, through the winter and next summer. Yes. I'm trying to think. There, not, there oh. was a birth, and I missed a week. So if you already heard this, we'll just celebrate again, shall we? We could celebrate again. Excellent. It's always good to celebrate. Regan Laura Roos, the grandparents back there in the back, and the great-grandma, one of them. Both great-grandmas are delighted, and the grandparents are proud as punch, and Mindy and Doug Berdadish's granddaughter, Regan. Yay. Welcome aboard. It is good. And it, you may notice the pictures around you. We do want to encourage, uh, we are focusing in on the wonder of life, the wonder of God's creation, the wonder and abundance that God presents in our life. And so we would, here are some of photos, some are from Pastor Steve, some of mine, some of the Inghams. Uh, we have some that you have submitted in the past, like at Pentecost. Uh, but our, if there's additional things that you see as we continue through this worship season series, please send them to us and we will exchange them out or hang them in additional places in the church because it is a wonderful life and God has indeed blessed us. If you would like to study and, and go deeper into your relationship uh, with money and God and how that all fits together. We are going to have a couple opportunities for study. You can reflect on at home by yourself. You can come and meet with me on Thursdays either in the fellowship hall at 10 or 7 p.m. on Zoom. I do need to know if you want an invite, so let me know. If you didn't buy the book, I have some of the pages photocopied. Um, so come and ask for that, and, and you can go deeper into the spiritual practices that we have. And, yes, enter fully into this time of worship, this time in which God invites us. 
because the relationship of money, practices, and faith was a com as complex in Jesus' day as it is in ours. And so in this worship series, we will light a special candle each week, asking God to illumine the shadowy corners of our lives where unspoken yet powerful fears often reside, often too often connected with money. May we sing. As we light this flame to affirm that where there is light, where there is understanding, where there is compassion, where there is possibility, holy and living God, transform our fears into awe-inspired wonder. Open us to this light and to the rich possibilities that it brings us for a wonderful life. Our relationship with money has a history as long as our lives, but also as expansive as the family systems and cultures of which we are a part, creating spiritual practices for how we deal with money invites us to look back to see with new eyes how and when our values and our fears were initiated. The movie, It's a Wonderful Life, yes, it all fits together, starts with God making arrangements to send an angel to assist George Bailey, if you may recall. And God says, There's a man down on earth that needs our help. Clarence, the angel, responds, well, Is he sick? No. Worse, he's discouraged. Like George Bailey, we sometimes need some help in the midst of the discouragement that can come with our fear about money. We look back with a practice of compassion for ourselves and for others and a faith that reminds us of our true worth. Today we're going to learn a new song, and it will be our gospel acclamation throughout, so I'm going to have uh, Colleen play it through once and then we'll join in singing it twice, okay? Ready? To be full of love, to be full of grace, to be full of peace is a wonderful life. Second verse. Giving others love, giving others grace, giving others peace is a wonderful life. And oh, 
I goofed. The gospel, I need a Bible. <laughs> and I had it, but then I put it down. Let me see if there's one back here, hopefully. Or is there one, ushers, is there one in the... We put them a lot away. Oh, you found one? Yes? Okay. We have one there. Yay! It's stuck in the pew. Good place for a Bible. Could you go grab it for me? I'm changing things up because our lectionary for today reflected George very well. So hold both the Matthew text and we're also going to look at Mark. Doesn't the rain sound wonderful outside? So, Mark chapter 10, starting with the 17th verse. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up to Jesus and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your mother and your father. And the man said to him, Teacher, all all of these I've observed from my youth. And Jesus, looking upon him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come. Follow me. At that saying, his countenance fell, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With human beings it's impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, this man approaches Jesus in a very different way than the Pharisees. While the Pharisees are interested in trapping Jesus with their questions, to get Jesus to reveal that he's anti-government and disloyal to Caesar, or show the people that he approves of an economic system that keeps them oppressed. They come with, is it lawful? They think the law is black and white, yes or no, legal or not. Yet Jesus knows the question of money and our relationship to it is far more complex. So when this man comes and falls at his feet, clearly wrestling with his face, with his faith, not his face, Jesus has compassion for his desire to find a guarantee, a measurement, or an accomplishment that he can achieve so he'll be certain of eternal life with God. When Jesus starts naming off the commandments, dealing with the community and protecting those relationships between people, you can almost see the man getting excited. He's like, I know this stuff. Feels like he cuts Jesus off before Jesus can say anything about them. Yes, I know them. I've been observing them ever since I learned them at the synagogue. I can do this. Can you imagine Jesus' smile, filled with love and wisdom, humor, and mixed with sadness? At how earnest and sure the man is that he believes what he is saying, 
and how hard it will be for this man to see what is preventing him from living fully into the kingdom of God. So he tells the man, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have. Take the money you get for your stuff and give it to the poor. Then, then you will be ready to follow God's way. The man leaves, shocked, grieving, discouraged. Which leaves the disciples and us also discouraged. In the case of the disciples, they believe, as Job's friends did, and most of the culture at that time, that wealth, possessions, were signs of being in God's good graces. God's blessing. If the man's wealth was not a sign that he had a spot in the kingdom of heaven, then who could be saved? I mean, what indicated the abundance of God better than bigger barns, more cattle, more servants, leisure, and the security and the power that it brings? Shaking his head, Jesus says, no. Wealth creates stumbling blocks for people and their attempts to live in relationship with God and in their relationship with others. God cares about both, and we know this. Yet we don't talk much about it in church. I'm pretty sure that you could probably count on one hand how many sermons I've given on money. It's a tab... tab <clears throat> It's a taboo word, a private matter. But by not talking about money, did you know how many verses in the Bible have to do with money? 2,000. By not talking about money and how it interacts with our life of faith, we are ill-equipped to deal with the stumbling blocks that Jesus warns about. Money on its own, it's neither good nor bad. I mean, it's necessary for our survival. Very few of us are out there growing all of our own crops, raising the chickens and the cows and everything that we would need to survive without getting something from someone else. And it also drives, this money drives an economic system that we've become swept up in, that we have very little control over, and most of us barely understand. I mean, all you have to do is, is look at our county right now and the, the price of houses and people not being able to afford rent and, and the inability to find employees or listen to our political parties banter about the budget. It's huge, and it impacts every part of our lives. And while we cannot change this monster of a system that we're a part, we can accept Jesus' invitation to look at our relationship with money and how it impacts our lives as disciples of Christ trying to follow in his way. Especially in the way in which Jesus invites us to interact with our neighbor, especially the poor. Yesterday and the next few weeks, we we're invited to reflect upon how our relationship with money shapes our understanding of, of abundance and scarcity to be honest with ourselves about how we measure our worth and the worthiness of others. And remember that we do not own any of this. I mean, that's what we hear in, in the gospel lesson that I didn't read in Matthew. Everything belongs to God. And only God is good. We are but stewards of all of this, with the free will to tend to God's resources wisely or foolishly in ways that give life or take it away. 
So we have some spiritual practices to help us determine how we're doing in this part of our walk of faith. And this, one of the spiritual practices that is, is lifted up in the book is to have a conversation with God by looking back. Because most of our experiences with money were shaped when we were really, really young. So look back at your earliest memories of money. I remember collecting penny, pennies in a glass peanut butter jar. I also remember the, the day that my dad took me to open up my first bank account. What it felt like when I realized that a Wendy's meal deal cost me slightly over an hour of my work that did not make me happy. Getting hand-me-downs from my cousins, being turned to turn off the lights when you leave the room and turn off the faucet when you're brushing your teeth, buying generic brands. My grandpa in Nebraska bragging about being a thrifty Scotsman and struggling when I was confirmed and we were given offer that offering box of envelopes, not knowing what or how to give, especially because I didn't have a job. So think and reflect this week. How did your parents, your grandparents act around money? What did they teach you about it? about spending, saving, giving? Did you feel like you had enough? Or were there fears connected around money? Do you recall positive and negative experiences? Write them all down. What shaped your sense of security? How was your money used? Who was in charge of it in your household? feelings that you and others had around it. I mean, we have all kinds of healthy and unhealthy energies that get stirred up around money, and that's why It's a Wonderful Life has been pulled into our conversation, because each of them responds in different ways to the crisis of money that's in the movie. So if you haven't watched it recently, watch it through that lens. How, how are people responding to the challenges of money in their lives? And see where maybe fear or power or manipulation, denial, generosity, shame, anger, self-preservation, and all kinds of other experiences become part of your relationship with money. Look at the parts of your life that aren't always easy. I mean, if we can't talk about a church, we probably don't talk about it very well, maybe around friends or, I mean, it's just not a topic we could bring up. So it's going to be hard, but I invite you to keep stick with it. Because the only way that we can discover and prevent being tripped up by um, money as Jesus warns in our life of discipleship, is to know where both the blessings and the pitfalls reside. And try not to judge. Just bring it out in the open. And then ask God to help you heal and grow and live more and more in God's way. Because this is what Jesus is talking about with the man and asking him. It's not really about his possessions but his whole life, his whole self. It's not what the man does, but Jesus wants his whole undivided attention on what God is doing, inviting him to lose his life in order to save it, to find real life, abundant life, that cannot be measured by all the items of success that the world brings. Jesus gives this man a way to make room for the gifts that God gives. And we don't know from the story if the man will continue in his discouragement. 
or if he'll begin to wonder about this conversation with Jesus and no longer see his life as empty or worthless without all the stuff that the world values in it. Instead, listen and reflect and be filled by the gifts that God wants to give, these gifts of love and grace and peace that continue to spread out and grow and multiply the more that they are given away. May you rejoice in this promise today. Amen. Let us continue in our prayers and today invite you as you'll see here as you hear on if you're joining us over the airways to throw in your own petitions uh, aloud that we might all pray with you together or within your own head and heart where God can hear creating God. For the awesome wonders of creation, the abundant feast of family and friends, the plentiful riches of your presence among us, we give you thanks. We are so grateful, O God, for each other. Loving God, for those times that feel rife with heartbreak, too much stress, too little assurance, a plethora of pain and not enough possibility, be with us. We lift to you, O God. Here in our corner of your creation, we 
We lift up Jack and Darlene, Kathy, Don, Steve, Debbie, Jean, Mary, David, Francis, Dar, Carrie, Alyssa, Betty, George, Chris, Charles, Nikki, Wendy, Cara, Trey, Tom, Hunter, Mike, Marguerite, Janet, Luther Park, residents, families, and staff, all healthcare workers and facilities, and nations and communities in crisis, and the relief efforts by organizations like ELCA Disaster Response and Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services and U.S. military personnel serving the people in greatest need. Gracious God, for those times when our contributions bring more negativity than positivity, more resentment than forgiveness, more breaking down than lifting up, forgive us. In this silence, we open the books of our hearts and make an accounting. Already we know you have balanced the ledgers through Jesus Christ, O oh God, and you hold nothing against us. You forgive all debts. We are so deeply grateful and commit ourselves to creating more good in the world in your name. Amen. Amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. Find a way to share peace safely with those near you, here, at home, wherever you may be. Of, uh, of reflecting on the wonders of full way in which God fills our life, we'll be inviting members of the congregation to offer up what they are wondering about, and so thankful for Trish to be able to offer her wonder this morning. church fellowship. I appreciate the community, the sense of belonging that we have here at First Lutheran Church. It's very powerful. It has always been very powerful. And I pray that it will continue. So thank you all for blessing me in this way.
Let us pray. Gracious God, looking back, we see the generosity of those who came before us, acknowledging their hardships and struggles, their joys and gains that bring us to the place we are now. In looking back, help us to build a foundation for those who will look back at our lives, those who will be affected by what we do, what we offer, what we give. Help us to rejoice in the knowledge that our lives are being changed now and in the future because of what we are able to do with this collective offering. In the name of the one who calls us to the loyalty of justice, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And place your hand on these beautiful quilts. Oh, this abundance of time and love and stitches that the women of Lutheran World, well, women of First Lutheran Church have done with Lutheran World Relief. They will be collecting these quilts and kits uh, this week in Spokane and will be sending them near and far. And this, this quilt, while abundant in color in our place, this one quilt will be abundance for a family who knows that you, they are now loved and they are worth, worthy. So today we seek God's blessing as we gather with thanksgiving to dedicate these quilts to the glory of God. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, we pray for grateful hearts, for humble awareness of the abundance amid all the world's poverty and pain. We pray for the courage to give generously of our resources, our imaginations, our time and abilities, our material wealth. We pray for confident hope in the presence of such overwhelming needs to know that each offering of money, quilts, and material resources makes a welcome difference to others and to you. Thank you. 
for the gift of the hands, time, and prayers that went into each of these quilts. Bless the fruits of their labor that these quilts may bring healing, hope, and new life to those who receive them. We also give you thanks for the ongoing efforts of Lutheran World Relief and their partners. Help us to continue upholding them in our prayers, our gifts, and our willingness to learn more about their ministry that ever-widening circles of care, justice, and peace may be felt in this world. Amen. Amen. And to support you in discovering this wonderful life that God has given you, uh, there are both the mini revolutions that are out on one of the tables out there, as well as reflection questions, questions that will go with each week that you can ponder. Uh, they're also out there. So as we leave with God's blessing, in this movie, It's a Wonderful Life, there is a toast. Yes, you may rise as you're able, if you're able, yes. There's a toast that you may recall that's part of a blessing during their, this series. George and Mary generously help out an Italian family. The Martinis move into their new home in Bailey Park. And there, there's a four-room frame house that's been constructed for immigrant, fa immigrant families. Mary and George offer a brief speech at the Martini's doorstep during a housewarming party, and then symbolically hold up a loaf of bread, a bottle of wine, and a box of salt. Receive their blessing and our blessing. Bread that this house may never know hunger. Salt that life may always have flavor. And wine, the joy and prosperity may reign forever. For all these symbols carry messages from our faith journey. The bread of life is the true sustenance that God provides. The fruit of the vine is the love poured out by Jesus, a sign of the never-ending grace that is ours now and forever. And we have been called to be salt of the earth, so that all may savor the spice of life that is the Holy Spirit's presence among us. You've been reminded of these things here in our time together. Now go in peace. Serve the Lord. For it, for it is, is a wonderful, wonderful life. life. I didn't hear you. <laughs> for, for it is, is a, a wonderful, wonderful life. life. Amen. Amen. Grab a quilt or two.